All right, today on Making the Argument, we're going to discuss the everything bubble, how the Fed caused it. But most importantly, what we're going to go over today is the fact that we have got ourselves into a situation where the Fed really only has one of two ways they can go on this. There's a lot of nuance, but there's one of two major directions they can go. We're going to discuss what those are. We're also going to discuss what should our political representatives actually do about this policy in order to ensure that we don't get into one of these bubbles in the future. And then we're going to hit on something I think is important on an individual level because it can get really frustrating to think about all of these things that feel so far outside of our control. So it's kind of a special bonus at the end here. We're also going to talk a little bit about what can you do on an individual level to prepare for what is about to happen. All of that and more coming up on this episode. We're excited for our good friend Christian Hines to take the reins today to walk us through this interesting topic. I'm excited and I think we're going to learn a lot. If you haven't already, we'd love to hear from you in the volley chat and discuss this topic more. You can do so by heading to the description of this podcast on YouTube or on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen. Click that link, join, and say hello in the Introduce Yourself channel, and we look forward to hearing from you there. All right, as always, I'm your host, Nick Freitas, member of the Virginia House of Delegates, but other than that, a reasonably good person. My beautiful bride, Tina, Queen of the Bees, is not here today. She should be back next time. But today, I, we need a special introduction for Christian today. We do. Not only is he the <laughs> resident historian and political prognosticator, but he was he was really the one that wanted to push doing this episode, did a lot of the research, um, and so he's he's going to be taking it away today. Isn't that so? Uh, yeah, I'm super pumped for this. He's super, he's super <laughs> excited. You're all you're all gonna, you're all going to find out what makes Christian really excited. And ladies, he's single. All right. And then we've also oh got, yeah, you want to talk about liquidity yeah. and quantitative <laughs> easing? <Yeah. laughs> That's Christian's fellow tag, right? <laughs> and then, of course, our producer of producers, Nicholas Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking, which is actually going to be a topic again. Today. Again, yeah. wow. Again. I'm Amazing. Excited. All right, All right. Christian. I am so excited. Started, I, get, now, now, we've talked about this subject before, so our audience mm -hmm. is, is, you know, is versed on, on stuff with inflationary monetary oh, yeah, policy, if, but we can, we can never assume that it's only our current audience watching. You know, they share it with other people. So give us a little bit of background with respect to why are we in the position we're in right now? Okay, so long story short, I've got actually a paper that was published in November 2010. Um, that's the one piece of information I'm going to give you. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to read the entire thing. There's only like two paragraphs here that I'm actually going to read. Yeah. And I want you two to guess who wrote this. Okay. This was over a decade ago. All right, and this have, is going have, to get to the heart of why we're in the problems are you gonna that read we're currently it? in. Yeah, He's I'm gonna, gonna read okay. two paragraphs and we gotta guess who the author of this report was. We have not seen it. Hamilton and I have not seen it. Go ahead. Okay, so the paper uh near the end, it says, um uh Absent of such risks, they're talking about the, the risk of, of uh, inflation. Okay. Um, low and falling inflation indicates that the economy has considerable spare capacity. There's tons of Fed speak here. Yeah. Um, implying that there's scope for monetary policy to support further gains in employment without risking economic overheating. Um, and then um, FOMC is an acronym that basically stands for um, the Federal Reserve's like board of directors, right? Um, the FOMC decided this week that with unemployment high and inflation very low, further support to the economy is needed. With short-term interest rates already about as low as they can go, the FOMC agreed to deliver that support by purchasing additional long-term securities, as it did in 2008 and 2009. The FOMC intends to buy an additional $600 billion of longer-term secure uh, treasury securities by mid-2011, and will continue to reinvest repayments of principal on its holdings of securities as it has been doing since August. And then I'm going to end with this. This approach eased financial con uh, conditions in the past, and so far it looks to be effective again. Stock prices rose and long-term interest rates fell when investors began to anticipate this additional action. Easier financial conditions. This is the important part. Easier financial conditions will promote economic growth. For example, lower mortgage rates will make housing more affordable and allow more homeowners to refinance. Lower corporate bond rates will encourage investment. And higher stock prices will boost consumer wealth and help increase confidence, which can also spur spending. Increased spending will lead to higher incomes and profits. That, and a virtuous cycle, will further support economic expansion. Okay. I'm going to go with... Wait, wait a second. Before I guess, 
I want. Can I do a quick summary for the audience on this? Yeah. Okay. Basically, what this person is saying, and I have an idea of who I think it is. What this person is saying is, because inflation was relatively low, and because in, they they wanted to get better employment numbers, they were basically saying what they were going to do was they were going to make cheaper money. So this is this is the idea of lowering interest rates and printing money in order to fuel more economic investment, more hiring, more building, et cetera. So, right. So the argument that the argument that was being made was is that if the Fed engages in engages in more inflationary style monetary policy, this will be good for the economy overall because after all inflation is low right now and this is going to spur economic activity and investment. That's what it was. Think of it a little bit like saying, you know what? My, my debt's not that high right now or it's manageable right now, so I'm going to take this credit card and I'm going to run around, I'm going to spend a bunch of money because that's going to fuel economic investment and that's going to be good for me. Um, I, I don't think that's that, that's an, that's a simplification, but I don't think it's a bad oversimplification. No, I, I think it's it's the whole entire idea that interest rates were already at zero by yeah. 2010 because of the crash in 2008. Yeah. So the only other tool that central banks could use to boost the economy was to pump money into the yeah, system. Pump I think it's Janet Yellen. It was Ben Bernanke. Oh, man. That Good. wrote this paper here. I'll go to the top. <laughs> ben Bernanke, who wrote this. This is on the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors website, by the way. Yeah. It's still up there. You think yeah. they take it down yeah, by like, now. Oh, that's embarrassing. He wrote this column in November 2010, talking about aiding the economy, what the Fed did and why. And yeah. he, he basically explains, you know, the crash in 2008, the Fed's response to the crash. And then he's outlined, by the way. At the time of him writing this, he was chairman of the Federal Reserve. Yeah. Um, for those who, yeah. who you know, weren't following politics 12 years ago, right? He was chairman of the Federal Reserve at the time, and he outlined an economic plan for recovery after the 2008 crash that involved keeping interest rates at zero and the Federal Reserve buying large amounts of either corporate debt or federal treasuries in order to pump money into the economy, either into the government yeah. or into the broader stock market. And he literally said here that higher stock prices will boost consumer wealth. You know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of the left accusing us of yeah. trickle-down economics. Yeah. This is literally trickle-down economics, if you think about it. It's the idea that the Federal Reserve will create money yeah. out of thin air, create money, and then they will go into the marketplace and buy something with that money. They will buy a treasury bond with that money. Now, Congress has money that they can spend on whatever program they want, or... Banks have money that they can start lending out to people, and combined with zero percent interest rates, more people will want to borrow that money. Well, and, and the other the other part that's interesting about this is it, for for our audience to understand, Republicans, Reagan, this trickle down economics gets associated with Reaganomics or supply side economics. It's a pejorative, right? It we never there is no Republican that came out and said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do trickle down economics. What's that? Well, we're going to give money to rich people, and it's going to trickle down to poor. We never did that. We never suggested that. What supply side economics was is that if you remove all of the various, if you remove onerous taxes and regulations and various burdens on the production of goods and services that people want, that actually lifts all boats because what you're doing is you're making it easier to engage in entrepreneurial activity, and entrepreneurial activity is directed toward serving customers. Right. So the theory was is if, if we remove these onerous government burdens on producing stuff, people will produce more stuff, which will make people's right. lives better in the form of not only jobs, but access to consumer goods. Yes. And Democrats came in and said, oh, that's trickle-down economic theory because you're giving tax cuts to these people that are producing things. Christian's absolutely right. You want to talk about what real trickle-down economics is? It's this sort of inflationary monetary policy and this idea that the government's going to take money. It's either going to take money from people that have earned it, or it's just going to randomly print money and throw it out. And like we said before, when the when the Fed engages in inflationary monetary policy, that doesn't mean they're cutting everybody in America a check. That money is going generally to bigger banks or directly to the government. People who already have money. Through treasury bond purchases, right? And then they're saying, oh, but this is going to be good for the, the economy. The prosperity will trickle outwards from there. Yeah. So it's it's a, it yes. is a joke. They are, they are once again accusing us of doing the very thing they're advocating for. Yes. I'm going to end... Uh, with this, there's one last line here that he hints at where he says, although asset purchases, whoops, 
where he says, although asset purchases are relatively unfamiliar as a tool of monetary policy, some concerns about this pro approach are overstated. Critics have, for example, worried that it will lead to excessive increases in the money supply and ultimately to significant increases in inflation. And then he ends with basically dismissing it and saying, there's no way that's going to happen. Yeah, we'd never do that. Okay, <laughs> so that's enough of looking at Ben Bernanke. I'm sorry, but... I think the history, the, the record has shown that he was 100. He couldn't have been more wrong. Yeah. He could not have been more wrong because the reason that we have inflation, I'm sorry to break it to Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders. The reason we have inflation right now is not because of evil, greedy corporations. Yeah. It's not because of evil, greedy, rich people. It's because the government printed $5 trillion in 24 months and yeah. pumped it into the stock market and the real estate market. Yeah. And now those bubbles, the everything bubble that you've alluded to. And at the government spending. Yes, and government spending. There, there's two sides of this. In fact, I'm, I'm actually going to get into some details about the consequences of this because now that we've understood the origins of the problem. Yeah. The origins of the problem are not price increases from evil, greedy corporations. The origin of the problem is the government printed money yeah. and deflated the value of the currency. And now, 14 years later or two years later, in the in the form of, of the QE Unlimited yeah. that was the 2020 response and the 2021 response to COVID, now we are literally paying the price for this in the form of higher inflation and lower purchasing power. So long story short... That's how we got into this problem. It began with the Federal Reserve's response to the 2008 crash. This has been going on for 14 years oh, yeah, now. Long time. So, was were these practices ever used pre 2008? Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. so yes, not to the extreme not to that the they extreme were. That they are right now. So it's important to understand when he when he talks about like buying up these assets is is a little bit. The Fed used to again. The Fed has has two major functions. It's it's like full employment and a stable currency. Which, right. ironically enough, those two conflict with one another. It, it, and so what they've what they've essentially done in, in the past is they've they've lowered interest rates, um, and 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 sometimes they they've lowered them inappropriately in order to try to fuel economic growth, and then they raise them to try to slow down economic growth. And and what's ridiculous about that whole notion is the idea that there's any agency that should speed up or slow economic growth. That's not okay. what's happening. What they're actually doing is speeding or slowing the creation of money or debt. Mm. Uh, and, and then they're hoping that will have positive impacts on the economy. Not to get too far off track here, but what influence does the Federal Reserve have over jobs and oh, the amount of jobs? Oh, we're going to full we're gonna employment. Get in, okay, we're going to get into that. Yeah. Um, for for those that are watching or, or listening and not watching, and they're they're not able to like see charts and stuff like that, we're going to get into that once I I start explaining Beautiful. the two paths that Nick alluded to at the yeah. beginning of this episode that the Federal Reserve can do. We've just been talking about. What's been going on before? We're, we've just wrapped up the whole origin of the problem. Now we're going to get into where are we currently at and Beautiful. what are the options looking forward? Well, and, and, and to, to answer one thing on that, though, right, because people have this idea that, oh, well, if their mandate is full employment, then they must have what, – what do they do? They have the ability to force employment, to hire people. To, no, they have, the ability, they have the ability to manipulate the marketplace in order to try to fuel more employment or less employment. Right. So it's not as if they have some sort of like mandate or power to go in and, you know, hey, you will Create hire this jobs. many people. Right. That's not it. It's they, they have an enormous amount of power over currency and monetary policy and 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 will try to manipulate in that such a way in order to encourage employment. And then am I correct in thinking that the encouragement of employment would come through that business or corporation taking on more debt? Usually, but not always. Yeah, not always. It can it also depends. deal with the money supply in general. If there's more money sloshing around the system, it's okay. easier for you to hire people because there's a larger gotcha. amount of money supply. Um, so, so now that we've outlined, you know, the problem, the origin of the pro the origin of the problem is quantitative easing, and quantitative easing is a fancy Fed term for money printer go burr. It is. It is. I've <laughs> yeah. said this over and over again on this podcast when we've talked about economic stuff before. It's printing money, right now, and which, by the way, creates income inequality because guess what? Poor people generally don't invest in the stock market. Rich people do. Yeah. And so when you're pumping money in the stock market, guess who benefits from that? Rich people do. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Well, and the middle class generally does, but typically through things like 401ks. It's or not like or smaller amounts. Yeah, they're not, smaller they're amounts, not trading, yeah. you know, $150,000 yeah. per trade, they're, right? They're not, they're not hedge fund managers. Yeah. yeah. So now that we've outlined the origin of the problem, long story short, the Federal Reserve, since 2008's response to the crash, the housing crash, which, by the way, was also a Federal Reserve-induced bubble, which is a whole other story, their response was, well, we're going to create an everything bubble now. 
we had a dot com bubble in the 90s. We had a housing bubble in the early 2000s. Now we're going to have an everything bubble. Everything's going to be in a bubble. So the Federal Reserve is basically now trapped because at the moment, they have created a giant bubble in the equity markets. We've called it the everything bubble. But the problem is, is that inflation is out of control because the Federal Reserve has printed $5 trillion in the course of 24 months. So what can they do? The only way that they can tackle the inflation problem, long story short, unless the Federal Reserve returns to normal inflation rates, the economy will crash. What's normal? Normal is 2%. That's what the Fed usually targets, okay. 2% or less. Um, so unless the Federal Reserve, and we're currently at 8.5%-ish, 8.3%. Officially. Officially. Yeah. And, and we've, on this podcast we've, we've before. We've discussed how it's actually probably closer to around 15 to 18% if you're using the same sort of calculations that they use in the 80s. Yes. And, Early 80s. And so long story short, unless they can get inflation under control, the economy is going to continue to suffer and the middle class will be wiped out because they have no hedges against inflation. Inflation is is a regressive tax on poor people. The poorer you are, the worse off you are because of inflation. Mm. Can, we, can we give a simple example of this? Yeah, quick? go ahead. So think of it this way. If you're wealthy and you have a lot of liquid assets, which means you have a lot of either cash on hand or you have things that you can easily convert into cash in order to spend. <clears throat> when inflation starts to go up, what you see those people do is they get out of like just holding cash and they immediately put it into things which are more inflation-friendly sort of assets or stocks or Property. things like that. Exactly. And so what ends up happening is that their overall portfolios are, are do all right or do significantly better. Or in some cases, they really know how to game the system, do significantly better because they, they have the ability to move assets over into inflation-safe um, sort of investment vehicles. Yeah. Now, if you're someone that's living off of Social Security, right, right. Or, or you're depending on Social Security or your retirement or whatever it is, the value of your dollar is incredibly important because you're you're spending what you take in. And it's fixed. Yes. You, you are spending what you take in, and you're going to make $50,000 this year, and you're going to make $50,000 yep. next year, and you're going to make 50000 the year after that, and you don't have additional capital or resources to shift into you know inflation-friendly assets or whatever mm -hmm. it is. So- the overall your overall wealth diminishes every single year as you go on because in the value of your overall dollar so it you had 50,000 last year let's say let's say you even have they they you know adjust it and you have 55,000 next year okay but if inflation was going up at a higher rate than the amount of money that you're depending on year to year you're actually less wealthy each year Whereas the people that are able to shift their assets into something which is, is not as affected by inflation, they can actually either stay the same or get more wealthy as mm -hmm. time goes on. But again, if you're if you're down here, there's almost no way that you can you can hedge against right. inflation. That, that, that's why I said that quantitative easing exacerbates uh, exacerbates income inequality. Yeah. But long story short, the the two options that we've got here is the Fed can either tackle inflation or they can try to save the economy, and the irony is, is that trying to tackle inflation will result in destroying the economy, but not trying to tackle inflation will result in destroying the economy. To give you an idea, the Federal Reserve so far has raised interest rates this year alone from effectively zero. They had a zero, uh, effectively 0% 0 Fed fund rate to 3.25%, and they've done that over the course of 10 months. Um, they've done three back-to-back-to-back 0.75% rate hikes, which is tied for the highest rate hike ever. And this is th this is the amount of interest the Federal Reserve charges at its at its lowest level. The highest rate 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 hike ever. What does that mean? Um, so when the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, that's called a rate hike. Sure. The highest percent of a rate hike at any given time is is three quarters of 1%, 0.75%. Okay. They've done that three times in a row. They also did, I think, like a 0.25 and a 0.5% rate hike. So now the Fed fund rate is at 3.25%, um, which is considered a neutral level, by the way. Anything below 3% is considered like, oh, we're trying to pump up the economy. 3 to 5% is neutral. Anything over 5% so is... So they've been above 3.25% Oh, my God. So before. the highest it ever got was 20% okay. in 1980. Okay, yeah. but this, uh, this is the highest and, and, rate and the reason, in... And the reason why it got to 20% in 1980 was because they were trying to get the inflation out of the economy from the from the 70s. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, so the, what he's talking about is there's there's the rate itself, but then there's the speed with which you increase the rate. I understand, yes. Yeah. So 
Long story short, as I said, the Fed is trapped. They've got two problems in front of them. Right now, they're trying to address inflation. So let's see the response of what's happened around the world yeah. because the Fed has been raising interest this rates. This is very important. This is extremely important here. Let's start with looking at the NASDAQ com uh, composite. The NASDAQ is currently down almost 30% year to date as a result of the Federal Reserve turning off the money printers and raising interest rates from 0 to 3.25%. To give you an idea, in order to actually quench inflation, eventually the Federal Reserve will need to have what's called a positive real interest rate, an interest rate that is higher than the inflation rate. Well, if the inflation rate is 8.5%, even if it keeps dropping, let's assume the inflation rate eventually drops down to 5 or 6%. That means the Fed fund rate will need to be at least 5 or 6% in order to put a dent in inflation. The Nasdaq fell 30% wow. from just being raised to 3.25%. Tell me about this. Why does the Nasdaq and the stock market have this reaction to interest rates I'm going to get into that. Yeah. So – I will be answering that question as soon as we're done going through sure. all of the devastation that has been going on because yeah. of the Fed raising interest rates. So that's the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ is down 30 percent year to date. The S&P 500 is down 20, uh, 21 percent year to date. The Dow Jones Industrial Index is down 17 and a half percent year to date. And now let's look at some of the foreign currency exchanges. As the Federal Reserve keeps raising interest rates and shuts off the money printer, you know what that does? They're fighting inflation, which means the dollar is going to go up in value. Yeah. That sounds like a good thing, but in some ways, that's not actually a universally good thing, and I'll get to why. There's, there's just there's consequences. There's consequences to it. The dollar is surging in value currently. Um, when you look at the um, the exchange rate between the pound, the um, the British currency, and the U.S. dollar, the pound is down sixteen and a half percent year to date. The euro is down thirteen and a half percent year to date. The Japanese yen is down twenty three percent year to date. And the reason why is because Japan has had unlimited quantitative easing since nineteen eighty nine. We yeah. actually did a Y minute about we that. Um, the Australian dollar is down eleven and a half percent year to date. And as the Federal Reserve continues to ratchet up interest rates and shut off the money printer, that is forcing a currency crisis around the world which has resulted in the Bank of England having to uh, engage in emergency measures to save their bond market from complete collapse. The Bank of England is now having to print money to buy treasury bonds. They're, they're called gilts over there. They're having to buy gilts in the UK in order to save their bond market from complete collapse because the dollar keeps surging in value. Not only that, but the Federal Reserve's actions has also led to financial markets in Europe basically teetering on the edge of collapse. Credit Suisse, which is the second largest uh, bank in uh, in Europe, it's the second largest, or sorry, second largest bank in Switzerland. I wouldn't say European Union because Switzerland is not part of the EU. They're on the brink of collapse. Uh, Deutsche Bank in Germany, the largest bank in Germany, is down 39% year to date. They're not far behind Credit Suisse. And as we talked about earlier, as the Federal Reserve continues raising interest rates, what does that mean? That means mortgage rates are going up. Well, mortgage rates are now at a 16 year high. Wow. And the um, the mortgage rate currently in the U.S. is almost at 7%. It's it's just under 7%. We haven't seen that since, gosh, I mean, I guess I was in I elementary was the, school. I think it was the 80s, yeah. Well, and, and here, here's the important thing to understand about this, because as, as Christian's reading all this off, the, the, initial, the initial reaction I think most people would have is, well, then the Fed needs to stop raising interest rates. And that's... That is going to be the second course yes. of action we talk about, because the first course of action is you've got to... You've, if you raise interest rates, you're taking the inflation out of the economy. But as we can see, what ends up happening is all these industries, which were, and I, I hate to use this term, we'll say theoretically, because we're gonna we're gonna explain this more later, but theoretically benefiting from the inflationary economy, right, are now struggling because interest rates are going back up. Not only are they struggling, they're struggling only with a three less than three and a half percent interest rate. So that's it, interesting. So that's that one course of action where the Fed says, okay, we're going to keep raising interest rates until we we settle inflation, this is going to continue to happen. Can, can yes. you dive into that more, Christian, about the they're struggling at 3% interest rates when— Yep, I'm going to get into that. So so the, the, the Federal Reserve so far is only halfway through, so to speak, their mission of trying to get the interest rate higher than what yeah. the inflation rate is. And yet it looks like the economy is—my whole point is, is that— the economy is melting down at only 3% interest yeah. rates. Imagine what it'll be like when the Fed finally sets the, the Fed fund rate at 5 or 6 or 7%. What, what does it tell us that they are struggling this bad at 3%? It tells you that the bubble that the Federal Reserve has been blowing for the last 14 years is larger than anything we've ever seen before. Let me put it this way. Companies were not experiencing these high-level 
of, of numbers within their stock markets or everything else because there was genuine productivity and consumer demand. They were doing it because we were pumping money into the economy. Okay. And okay. that was inflating the overall price. So the value of these stocks were completely overvalued. And most of it, you, there's a thing called PE ratio, price to right, earnings right. ratio. It's a great way to determine whether or not a, a stock is actually providing good return on investment or whether or not it's speculation that the the stock or the company in, in the future will will you know be a, a economic powerhouse. When you start to see, when all of a sudden we start to lower inflation rates um, at, by increasing the you know, the rates, taking the inflation out of the economy. A lot of the companies that are just end up struggling as a result of that, it it generally means that their their overall value was not based off of their current, you know, price to earnings ratio, was not based off of their current productivity levels, was not based off of their current demand for whatever product or service they were providing. It was largely speculative. It was a mirage. Yes. And to give you an idea, companies are laying people off left and right. There's tens of thousands of layoffs going on We're around the country. We're not hearing about that. Yeah, well, I've got a list of companies that have announced major layoffs and hiring freezes. Um, Gap, 500 employees laid off. Bristol Myers Squibb, they're um, in the pharmaceutical company. 360. Wells, uh, Wells Enterprises, 319. Nordstrom, 200. There's some other wait, really wait, famous wait, wait, ones. Go, 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 Amazon, 395. Um I'm just skipping around to some more famous ones. There, there you go. Credit Suisse, 5,000. Yeah. That's because they're about to go under. Um, uh, Amazon, again, 353. Tencent, a Chinese company, 5,500. Wayfair, 900. Peloton, 800. Alibaba, 10,000. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I could keep going. Ford, 8,000. Like some of these are companies that you've never heard of, but some of them are companies that are quite famous. And, and just going down the list, this is July 2022. Lone Depot, Peloton, 2,000. Meta, 350. Rivian, they're an electric vehicle company, 700. Rivian hasn't even made a profit yet, I think. They're, they're one of those zombie companies that was yeah. propped up by the Federal Reserve. Twitter, 30% of its entire employee base. Like, I, Dang. This is this list just keeps going and going. There's Spotify, Netflix, it just keeps going. Coinbase, it keeps going and go CVS Health, Tesla, 10% of their employee base. It just keeps going and going and going and going. What is happening is the labor market is imploding at the moment because the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates. And not only is it, and, and I've just talked about the private sector. Yeah. What's going to happen to the government sector? Here's something from the Treasury's own website. It's actually incredible what they put in here. Maintaining the national debt. As of August 2022, it costs $677 billion to maintain the debt. This is just maintaining the yeah. debt, yeah. which is 12% of total federal spending. Just servicing the debt load. Imagine how higher that's going to be when the federal government is no longer paying 0% interest yeah. on that debt. This, this is the other thing that people don't fully understand is that the reason why the government has got away with running massive deficits and going into massive amounts of debt is in part because <clears throat> it, it didn't cost anything to take out the debt. It was not, there was nothing more associated oh, wow. with it. Right? So, so basically, you're giving me free money to spend. I got to pay the money back, but I don't got to pay any interest on the money that I that so, I got from so you. So why is it that when the interest rates in the private market increase, they also increase for the government debt? Because uh, so you got to understand, if, if if I when the government is going into this debt, oftentimes the government's not just going in debt for this one off spending that they're doing. The government's going into massive amounts of debt for entitlement spendings. It, it's like mandatory spending that the, that the federal government by law has to engage in on top of all the other debt spending that they're doing. And so the end result is, is that if they have to continue to main, maintain that spending um, and then all of a sudden the interest rates go up significantly, well, now the cost of going into debt goes up significantly. Okay. So for a long time now, the federal government could spend all this additional money, and they didn't have, again, it was like free money for them to be able to take and spend. Again, they had to pay it back, but they didn't have to pay any additional interest on it. Now they're going to have to start paying additional interest on it. It so gets interest on the, the way. Debt, is is it, it, that's just on the borrowing side. Yeah. Is it, are it, they paying interest on the debt that they've taken out already or just debt that they'll take out in the future? Both. Yeah. Well, well, they're they're paying interest on the debt they've taken out, and whenever they take on more debt, they're having to pay interest on that as well. Okay. And so, according to the Federal Reserve's or, or according to the Treasury Department's own website, from 2012 to 2021, the average interest rate on all federal debt is less than two percent. Well, the Fed fund rate is now 
almost three and a half percent. And it's looking like it's going to go to like five percent. So this number is going to skyrocket. And the debt is currently, well, this debt number is actually now over 31 trillion. They need to update it. What's funny is, is that you get to the bottom here and they have a question and answer. Why can't the government just print more money? <laughs> it's so funny that like, like in these obscure government websites, they explain like, why the government can't do the very things that it has been doing for a decade. So there so, are some sane people in the government. I suppose. But some. No, 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 the thing is that nobody's actually been following this advice. So, so long story short, I'm going to end with this last story here. UN urges Fed to pause interest rate hikes on global recession fears. Nick, you, you want to you wanna react to that? Yeah. So, again, and we talked about this last episode, too. The UN has a vested interest in things like you know, the great reset and, and much more of what they refer to as things like state capitalism. They, they've had an interest in <clears throat> centralized banks having more control over the you know, monetary policy of these various countries. The issue that we're in right now. So this is this is one course of action that, that Christian just kind of explained. We're going to go into the other course of action here in a second, right? Well, no, no. I've just given the recap of what has been going on. We're okay. about to get into okay. the so, consequences yeah. of the Fed continuing well, let, with let, what let's they're just, currently let's doing. Let's just go. Let's just go in and, and do that because we, we've essentially we've essentially established what has been going on, which has been inflationary monetary policy, and now the Fed is at a point where they're trying to whip the inflation out of the economy. By the way, a lot of other central banks around the world are doing the exact opposite. They're not trying to get the inflation. Yeah, the out. Bank they're, of England is they're printing, still money. printing. They're still printing. So now it's one of two courses of action. The Fed can either continue to raise interest rates in order to take care of inflation. And we've are, we're already starting to see the consequences. So even though we've done just a minor amount, right? 3.25, we're not talking about significant. We're nowhere near the 20% interest rates of 1980, right? We're seeing massive drop-offs in the stock market, within labor, within hiring practices, all of that. Mm -hmm. And the United States Central Bank is actually being more responsible than the central banks around the world. That doesn't mean they've been responsible up to that point. That doesn't mean they're being as responsible as they need to right now. But that's the consequence. And the UN is flipping out. Really? Because, yes, because our central bank doesn't just affect us. We're the reserve currency for the world. Yes. So we have a major impact as the largest economy in the world by far as the largest consumer economy in the world by far. So the UN is struggling right now because a lot of their economies are in part based off of their trade with the United States. All right, so the question is, is the Fed going to take option one, which is raise interest rates, or option two, which is either freeze or lower interest rates and go back into the inflationary monetary uh, cycle? And, and we, here's, we, here's yeah. why... Option one is going to lead to severe economic pain. We've already hinted at it yeah. before. I've got a couple bullet points. And I'm just going to skim through them because we've already talked about the pain that's coming or, or the pain that's happened. Here's the pain that's coming. No matter, uh, basically, if the Federal Reserve continues to raise interest rates uh, up to what what I I called earlier that positive rate where it's yeah. higher than inflation, it will eventually bring inflation down. But the costs on on imploding that everything bubble are going to be extremely painful. Quick, quick question for you: uh, If they were to raise interest rates above the inflation rate, mm -hmm. would the value of the dollar increase at that point? Oh, it would yes. explode. Yeah. It's already exploded. It, okay. it it would like double for, again for the first time. With, in, with the, the first, spending power for the first time in world history, yeah, the spending power of America is the spending power of people holding dollars would go up significantly. Okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> Which was interesting because that would also that would also trigger major imports into the United States because we have a stronger currency than anyone else. Now, what's fascinating is we're at a point right now where potentially for the first time in history, the U.S. dollar will be stronger than the British pound. We're very, very close. As I showed earlier, the, the British pound is almost at parity with the dollar, and, and it's fallen 16% this year alone. We're, we're at a closer point in time where the dollar and the pound are, are more similar to one another than at any point in history, going back all the way to the 80s, right after Volcker raised interest rates to yeah. 20%. So if the Fed continues with this course of action, here's what's going to happen. Mortgage rates are going to continue to skyrocket, which is going to tank the housing market. The housing market won't exist because people won't sell their homes that were yeah. locked into 2% mortgages. And nobody's going to be building because there's going to be no demand, which means that, that there, there just won't be – it's not the housing market's going to crash. There just won't be a housing market. Yeah. Um, Mortgage rates are going to continue to skyrocket. Consumer spending will fall because consumer spending, as we know, is mostly driven by debt right now. And with the inability to borrow more money or with higher interest rates, that means consumer spending is going to fall, which is going to crush corporate earnings. The collapse in corporate earnings is going to trigger – it's going to herald in a recession, which we're already in. But that's – going back to your P.E. ratio – 
um, talk earlier, that's that earning side. Once that earning side drops, the PE ratio is going to skyrocket, which is then going to put even more downward pressure on stocks. So stocks, we've already talked about, right, how the NASDAQ is is down, you know, almost 30 percent this year. It's It'll drop another 20 or 30 percent if the Fed keeps raising interest rates to the level that they need to. But um, globally, as the Fed continues to raise interest rates, that's going to put, as you said, even more upward pressure on the value of the dollar, which is actually really bad news for a lot of American corporations that do business overseas because Apple, for example, does two-thirds of their business in other countries. Well, what happens when the dollar shoots up 20% more versus the pound, the euro, and the yen? And Apple then sells an iPhone in Europe and then has to convert the euro back into U.S. dollars when they take that money and bring it home. Well, that money's a lot less than it used to be now. It's 20% less because the dollar's gone up 20% more than these other currencies, wow. which is going to hurt corporate earnings even more than it's already hurt. So long story short, and that's just on the private sector side. We talked about earlier that how um, the federal government can only fund itself through three ways. It can either print money, tax money, or borrow money. Well, if borrowing costs are going through the roof— and if the Federal Reserve is having to sell treasuries in order to kill inflation, how is the federal government going to fund itself? I'm sorry, but but the federal government, the, the, the Federal Reserve cannot buy treasuries to fund Congress if it's having to sell treasuries to deal with inflation. Can you give a quick overview of what treasuries are? It, it's, it's government debt. It, yeah. it's so basically, like, and, and here's the deal. The government has set up, this is, this is one of the biggest, I think this should be a scandal uh, that most people don't understand. Debt monetization, is that what you're about it, to get essentially, into? Essentially, well, it, it's more than that. Um, when you go and buy a stock, right, uh, in a private company, or you invest in a private company, right, and, and stuff like that, um, you have unrealized gains and all this. The government encourages people to buy government treasuries, which is essentially saying, I'm going to give, I'm going to loan the government money to spend, right? But then you owe me my money back with interest. And they set up tax shelters for that. So uh -huh. it's it's one of the because and here's why. If I invest in a private company and they do well and I lose money, I'm I'm out. Like I'm done. Like I don't I don't get that money back. But if I invest in a government treasury bond. I do get that money back because they can take it from somebody else by force through taxation, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So the, the government actually incentivizes people in bad times to stop investing in private companies and start investing within government bonds and treasuries. And because by the way, here's the little secret about how Congress has been able to operate and the federal government's been able to operate since 2008, because the federal government does not tax people the amount that it needs to in order to fund operations. And by the way, there's no way it could. Mm -hmm. The federal go I'm sorry to the tax the rich people, yeah. but the federal government could confiscate 100% of the entire wealth of both Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, the two most richest people in the entire world. They could take everything those two people have. And it would not be enough between the two of them combined to pay for the federal government for even 30 days. So to give you an idea of how massive the hole is in the federal budget deficit, it's so large that they've been playing accounting tricks since 2008 to fund the federal government. And here's how it works. The Federal Reserve prints money, creates it out of thin air, and then goes to the Treasury and says, hey, you're selling bonds? We'll buy, we'll buy trillions of them. And now suddenly Congress has trillions of dollars that they can spend on whatever it is that they want to spend money on. But where did that money come from? It didn't come from me buying the Treasury bonds. It came from the Federal Reserve creating them out of thin air and buying them. Now, the and, keep, and keep in mind, when they first buy it, they're getting the full value for that dollar because the inflation has not been realized in the economy yet. And when Congress spends it, they get the full value as well. But what that's done is, is that that's created inflation because as Congress continues to spend money, and they're spending more money than ever. Biden is spending trillions now. He just did a, a student loan bailout that's, that's, that's hundreds of billions of dollars. That is going to increase inflation at the same time the Fed is having to fight inflation, which means that they're going to have to raise interest rates even more now to deal with just Biden's fiscal policies. And so, again— as the Federal Reserve stops being the, the lender of last resort to Congress, that is going to be really painful for the federal government. So, so that's, basically, that's scenario one. That's scenario scenario one. one is the Federal Reserve shuts off the money printer, raises interest rates, and cuts cold turkey and says, you're on your own. And Congress, the, 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 the federal government goes through a debt crisis. The, Nash, the entire world goes through a currency crisis. And the U.S. economy goes through a depression unlike anything any of us have ever seen in our entire lives. If— 
the federal government refuses to cut any spending and the Federal Reserve continues to raise interest rates. It is the implosion of the everything bubble. That is scenario one. And as, as depressing or as, as scary as that sounds, scenario two is actually far more dangerous. And this is the part that is going to blow people's mind. Because Here, everything we just said would lead you to the conclusion that, well, then clearly what the Fed's got to do is, is cut rates. Yeah. Actually, that would be worse. Here's scenario two. The Fed pivots. You might have heard that phrase, actually, if, if you're listening. The, the Fed pivot. The Fed pivots, reverses course, and returns to 0% interest and unlimited quantitative easing. I've got some bullet points here, and I say, as terrible as the previous option sounded, this is the true doomsday scenario yeah. for those listening at home. Under this scenario, if the Federal Reserve finally folds to pressure from corporate America, from Congress, the European Union, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, and the UN itself, and abandons its pursuit of higher interest rates in a deleveraging of its balance sheet, deleveraging means selling those yeah. treasuries that it's been buying, right? If it continues to do that, because it's faced with an international currency crisis, a debt crisis, you know, a, a, yeah. a, a, all of the stuff that we talked about, right? What the Fed could try to do is just keep the game of musical chairs going, right? That they, they could continue trying to do what they've been doing for the last 14 years, where the Fed might keep tightening and deleveraging until it seems like the air is falling out of the bubble and, the, and you know, the, the support structures underneath the economy are giving way, and then it'll just return to quantitative easing and 0% interest rates. But- that will lead to hyperinflation because inflation is already at almost 10%, right? It's, it's at eight and a half percent. And we've talked about earlier and in previous podcasts yeah. that it's really in, above 10. If you Yeah. Will. It's, it's really above 10%. If the federal reserve continues inflating the bubble, there's nowhere for that money to go now, other than the real economy for 14 years, that money has been locked away in either banks, either the federal government's own balance sheet or in the stock market. And now because the Federal Reserve printed $5 trillion during COVID, that money has found its way into the real economy, which is why we're seeing massive inflation. Any printed money will continue to find its way into the real economy. We've reached that. We're a sponge, right? Yeah. Um, imagine, imagine all those things was a sponge, and the money that was being printed is the water. Well, the sponge is filled up with yeah. water, and what's going to happen? Well, that sponge is useless now. The water's just spilling out into the real economy, and it's flooding it with inflation. If the Fed turns the money printers back on, inflation will shoot through the roof. Yeah. If the Fed lowers interest rates, cuts interest rates to boost the economy and save it from a crash, it will flood the market with more money and it will create more inflation. And that, as we said earlier, is going to hurt poor people and, more than anybody else. And here, and here's why. And this is because <clears throat> people are looking at this going, <clears throat> wait a second. If everything's more expensive, well, then I need more money because they're, they're, the natural inclination is to assume that if it's more expensive, then I need more money to pay for it. The worst scenario is not things being more expensive and you having to have more. The worst scenario is showing up with your money and nobody accepts it because it's worthless. And that is the end game. That is the end game of the second step. That is why, as bad as the first scenario sounds, the second one is worse. And if you don't believe that's possible, go read the go read about the Weimar Republic. Go read about Zimbabwe two times when, where literally people would go to the store with piles of cash. And by the time they picked up an item off the shelf and got to the checkout, it would be more expensive. They had to make it illegal to burn money for warmth, right? Like this is, you need to understand as, as bad as this one scenario sounds, if you don't take out the inflation, if you don't completely take it out and get it under control, if you don't take your medicine, essentially, you're going to get to a situation where your currency gets to the point of being worthless. And that's the part where if you think all this other stuff is bad, that's that's where you get violence in the streets. That we actually want the bubble to pop, yeah. to be completely it honest. It has to. It has to, because the alter as I said, the Fed has two options, neither of them are good, but one is way worse than the other. One will look bad on TV, right? They'll, they'll show it on TV, the S&P 500 is crashing, the NASDAQ is crashing. And, and it will be bad for people on their retirement accounts and... and, and oh, I've lost tons of money already yeah. this year. I'm yeah. sure most people who are investing in the stock market have. Yeah. It will look really bad, and politicians will look bad. Politicians actually want scenario two, yeah. because scenario two is a secret silent killer. Yeah. Inflation is a 
silent tax. Scenario one is is looks bad on TV and they might get voted out of office if it looks like the economy is failing. But scenario two is you just keep the money printers going and you play the game of musical chairs all over again and the currency will continue to depreciate in value. Asset prices will go through the roof. The S&P 500 yeah. will skyrocket if the Fed p- pivots. Oh, yeah. But the reason it will skyrocket is not because of real prosperity being created. Right. It's not because more, more inventions are being made or the economy is growing. The economy will be shrinking as the as the stock market goes through the roof, the only reason it's going to be going through the roof is because the value of your currency is going to be eroded into the dirt. And the only way that you're going to be able to avoid that is if people put their money in places, the rich mostly will be able to put their money in places that will will weather the storm. They'll put it in stocks. They'll put it in gold. They'll put it in Bitcoin. They'll oh, put they'll, it in whatever it is. They'll buy a ton of real estate. Yes. Because you're not making more of that. You're not making more land. Again, right. the, the very things that have skyrocketed in value since COVID and then only recently started to dip when the Fed started to take the support structures away, those things will go back to soaring through the roof. And the dollar will have 9%, 10%, 20%. 30%, 40% inflation as the Fed continues to just pump money into the system. That's scenario two. You know what scenario two is? Scenario two is Zimbabwe with extra steps. Yeah. That's what it is. What, what are the extra steps? The extra steps are quantitative easing, lowering interest rates, yeah. more liquidity. It's, so can, it's can pumping you, can the you bubble. Give us a comparison between what happened in Zimbabwe and what's happening now and what may, may have been unique to Zimbabwe. I mean, really, what happened in Zimbabwe was. Quite frankly, the government in Zimbabwe looked at what the United States was doing and says, we can do it too. Yeah. They, 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 Zimbabwe was an experiment in modern monetary theory. And the United States, if the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates to zero and turns on the money printer again, we will officially become a monetary mon- uh, a modern monetary system if, if we do that. And that is a very bad scenario. So those are our two scenarios. The Fed can either pop the bubble and they can either do the right thing and they can raise interest rates to save – the American people from inflation in doing so it will cause economic pain. There is no avoiding it yeah, at this point. No, you cannot get around it. Like there, there is no, there is no way any new president or Congress or administration or fed chairman, there's no way anybody can go on and deal with what is, what is happening without there being pain. The question is going to be, and this is where we get into this next part. Yes. The question is going to be how much pain for how long and what do we learn from this and come out on the other side? Because here was the, here was the worst lesson that was learned from 1929. If I were to go and I would ask anybody about the Great Depression right now, they would have some concept of what I was talking about. Yeah. And they would probably think as it was it was a result of the stock market crashing because of overspeculation and and unfettered capitalism. And then FDR came in and saved the day. That is the schoolhouse version of what happened. And it's almost the exact opposite of what actually took place. You notice nobody talks about the Great Depression of 1921. And the reason why they don't is because there was actually a very, very different course of action that was taken when you had a massive economic downturn. So first of all, let, let's throw out some facts here that, that people need to understand. In 1929, you had a massive run on the stock market. It lost a significant amount of its value overnight. It was called Black Tuesday. Unemployment went up. You know, This is the whole picture of executives throwing themselves out the windows and committing suicide. Now, there was, there was a lot of overspeculation. The 20s had actually seen a lot of very, very good, sound economic growth But this was also a very new Federal Reserve, and you actually did also see a lot of speculative growth as a result of low interest, artificially low interest rates set by the Fed. And so when that bubble popped in 1929, you did see a lot of businesses that were based more off of speculation rather than actual productivity go out of business. The difference was, is that in 1929 was the first time we saw massive government intervention. In the the late 1920s, teens, 1919, 1920, when that was all taking place, the government's response was, we're going to cut taxes, we're going to cut regulations, we're going to cut government spending. Basically did all of the things that you were told never to do now. The end result was we had the roaring 20s. Yes, there was an economic downturn, but we got through it very quickly. Capital was was reorganized and capital was reallocated toward those investments which had sound principles and were producing things as opposed to ones that were overly speculative. In 1929, what happened is Herbert Hoover, who was a Republican, said, no, no, we're going to meet all the, I'm going to meet with all the business leaders. I'm going to tell them, don't fire anybody. Don't cut wages. Don't actually respond to the economic indicators that are taking place. And then he passed the Smoot-Hawley tariff. It was the idea that, well, what we need to protect American business is we need to protect it from foreign competition. Well, what did all of our foreign competitors do? They decided to shut down trade with the United States. They raised their own tariffs. So the end result was is the overall market for goods and services shrank significantly. 
And that's where most people don't realize that like nine months after the stock market crash, unemployment was back down below 10% and going down. The economy was recovering. The stock market itself had begun to recover. Yes. And then all of a sudden, we did this massive government in intervention with the Smoot Hawley tariff. Unemployment shot up over 20%, and it never went down below, I think, 14% until World War II. And the stock market cratered yeah. because FDR, of the global trade war. And it was so bad because because not only did Hoover pass the Smoot Hawley tariff, he started coming up with all these different government spending programs. Well, the only way the government could get that money was either through higher taxes, higher borrowing, or more money printing. FDR ran against that policy when he was running against Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover lost. FDR came in and doubled down on everything Hoover was doing. But the, the major difference was he was brilliant at the marketing. The problem didn't start under his administration. And he was brilliant at marketing what he was doing as he was sticking up for the little guy against all these big, greedy corporate fat cats. And the end result is we turned what should have been a two-year economic downturn into essentially a 12-year depression. Wow. The stock market did not recover until 1953. It was a 25-year period between its previous peak and a new peak. And it, all because of government intervention. If the response in 1929 had been the same as it was in 1921, yeah. it, there would have been a two-year contraction, and then the economy would have recovered the exact same way that it did in the early 20s. And there's two sides of the roaring 20s. One side was actual sustained economic yeah. growth brought about because of the policies of Harding and, and Coolidge. Yeah. And they cut taxes. They cut government spending yeah. to keep inflation low. And they raised interest rates in order to pop the bubble. Yeah. But then they didn't flood the economy with new money. They didn't play games with the system. They cut spending. They cut government spending. They cut taxes. And they allowed sustained economic growth. And then it was in the late 20s, the yeah. Federal Reserve started cutting interest rates and fueling the creation of a bubble that eventually popped in 1929. Yeah. And as Nick said, it was the government response to that popping yeah. is what triggered the depression. And that's, that's the question now when we ask, okay, what should the government do at this point? The Fed is absolutely going to have to raise interest rates. It has to stop inflation. It has to, has to, has to. There's no other. The other thing that we need to understand is that when we look at this, I'm like, oh my gosh, all this wealth is being lost. What you need to understand is the wealth was speculative. It was fake wealth. It wasn't genuine wealth based off of increased productivity. It wasn't based off of increased supply and demand. It was based off of the money, simply just printing more money and throwing it. It would be like saying we can make ourselves richer through counterfeiting. The individual dollar you hold, that, pe that piece of fiat currency, paper money, only has value if it's actually useful for the exchange of the things that really produce wealth, which are the goods and services, right? It, it, like little pictures of dead presidents are not in and of themselves valuable. They're only valuable in the extent that they can be exchanged for things that do have value, right? Your house, your tractor, your clothes, your foods, that's where the wealth is. Right? The money is just a medium of exchange. And, and we, have, we have now created this scenario where we've made a whole bunch of more money without creating all the actual things that actually represent wealth. Again, the, the, the food, the clothes, the tractor, the, you know, the goods and services. So it, it's not as if this wealth is collapsing it means that all of a sudden houses have all been burnt down and you know, the, you know, we, we've piled up all kinds of goods and services and destroyed them. Basically, a bunch of fake wealth. The problem is, is that a lot of people were actually making money and depending on that fake wealth for their jobs. A and, lot of corporations. For their There's investment, for their corporations, for the bottom line, all of that. You have to get rid of that. You have to take that out so that we can actually get on a path of sustained economic growth based off of real productivity. Not, right. not based on fa – yeah. can I just double down to what Nick said there? I wrote, a, I, I wrote a couple bullet points at the very end here about what we need to do going forward. And I really think that the biggest mistake of the last decade, going back to that column by Ben Bernanke where he yeah. outlined the Federal Reserve's plan to grow the economy and save us from the 2008 crash – Central banks advocated that prosperity would emerge from money printing, inflating the stock market. Green ticker go up. Yeah. But the real problem is, is that prosperity doesn't come from numbers on a sheet of paper. It doesn't come from the stock market going up. It doesn't come from, from my Robinhood account showing a green ticker every single day. 
Prosperity comes from real world technological growth, innovation, productivity, making things, goods and services. That's where wealth comes from. Wealth doesn't come from printing money. Wealth comes from doing things. Well, and, and, and important to that, though. It's doing things in line with what consumers want through voluntary yes, transactions. Yes, it's not digging holes in the desert. Yeah, it's not the government now coming in and going, oh, you're right. We need to produce more things. How about bombs? No. We need, we need consumer I've, I've actually goods. Got, I've actually got an analogy there. It, 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 to Nick's point, it's about producing things that consumers want, not what the government wants. No. Because you could produce a whole bunch of bombs and drop them on a whole bunch of cities. And you know what? Lockheed Martin's stock might go through the roof if you do that. But we would all be very poor as a no. result because we would be bombing out all the productivity that makes things, that makes us wealthy. Long story short, the Fed got it exactly the wrong way around. They, they literally could not have been more wrong. They thought that economic growth came from fueling demand, and it comes from fueling supply. If you want to fix this problem, we need to cut government spending and cut taxes in a way, not, not in a way that fuels the, the financial sector. You need to cut taxes in a way that encourages the productivity of goods and services that people like you and me and the listeners at home actually want to buy. Because as we saw during COVID, when the entire world was shut down and nothing was being produced, well, the federal government, you know, the Federal Reserve printed $5 trillion, but that didn't make us wealthier because nothing was being made. Instead, you had too much money chasing after too few goods. And the, the only response that the Federal Reserve can do now is, well, let's just take the money away. Well, that's only one half of the equation. The other half of the equation needs to be that we need to be passing laws and repealing laws and and repealing regulations and cutting taxes and cutting government spending in a way to make it easier for people to make goods and services so, that people want. So let, let's get on those two points, because our, our two final points is what should the government do and what should we do as individuals? So what, what the government needs to do is, again, if real wealth is a result of people producing goods and services that other people want to buy to improve their own lives, then the question that you have to ask yourself is, how do we make it easier for people to produce those goods and services? Now, some people in politics will say, oh, well, we, we need to give more money to these companies. No, because the only way you can give them money is by printing it, borrowing it, or taking it from the consumer in the first place through taxes. No, don't do that. But what you can do is you can remove the barriers you have put in place to make it more difficult for people to provide those products and services. And that comes in the form of regulatory reform. How much time, if I'm gonna set up a company, how much time, money, and effort do I have to spend trying to comply with numerous regulations which might be redundant, outdated, or make no sense? Okay, every dollar I gotta spend, every minute I gotta spend, every hour I gotta spend to do that means that the price of that good or service goes up and you make it more difficult and you disincentivize me from producing. So regulatory reform. How about things like licensure reform? We're at a point right now where the government is making it increasingly more difficult for somebody to be actually able to provide for themselves. And you look at some of these regulations and it's easy to say, oh, well, that license is there for your protection. But then you start to, you actually start to dig in and you realize that, well, no, some of these licensure requirements were actually put in place by established firms within the industry that didn't want to compete with smaller service providers. So yes, we need licensure reform. You need tax reform. We have taxes in the Commonwealth of Virginia that were literally put in place to fight the war of 1812. And they're still in place. Now, again, I, I'm, I'm always keeping an eye on the crown, right? But I don't think the British still represent the same threat that they did in 1812. But that tax, which is called the Beepole tax, essentially says that, oh, you want to start a business and you've got to buy capital goods in order to be productive in that business? We're going to tax you on that capital. I'm not taxing you on the profit. I'm taxing you before you even make a profit. You're taxing them on the investment. To even get the things <laughs> I need to produce, I'm taxing you up front. Yeah. Get rid of receipts taxes, right? Make it easier for people to produce the goods and services, not because you're trying to take care of the business owner. You're trying to take care of the economic transaction that will take place when you make it easier for people to produce and easier for people to buy the things that they want. And the more politicians and bureaucrats we take out of the transaction in between the consumer and the producer, the cheaper it will be, the better it will be, the more available it will be, and the more likely it will adapt to changing consumer needs based off of innovation within the marketplace. If you do all of those things, if the government said, you know what, we're gonna recognize that our constant 
micromanagement and intervention into the economy is what has created this problem. And so as we raise interest rates to get the inflation out, the other thing that we're going to do is cut taxes, cut regulations, engage in occupational licensing reform at the state level, and we're going to make it easier for people to produce and even easier for consumers to get what they want without us constantly meddling and intervening. We can actually weather the storm far faster than we're on track to weather it. And here's the important part we will come out significantly stronger on the other end because we will have actually learned the lesson this time. We won't be going back and looking at the 1930s thinking, gosh, FDR dragging what should have been a temporary recession into a 12-year depression. That was the right course of action because, you know what? Hey, we hate fat corporate fat cats. Uh, we, if we did what you just outlined, Nick, and I'm going to end with this. If, if there's nothing that you take away from this episode, but but this, it, or if there's only one thing you take away from this episode, let it be this. It's that economic expansion is what translates into higher stock prices. It's not higher stock prices that translate into economic expansion. Yes. You're never going to get economic expansion by manipulating the stock market or manipulating monetary policy. On the contrary, what you're going to get is a bubble yeah. that will eventually hurt everybody either because it'll continue to grow, scenario two, or it'll implode, scenario one. And we are currently witnessing the popping of that bubble. But to Nick's point, if we did exactly what Nick just said, we would come roaring back. Yeah. It would be like the good part of the roaring 20s, yeah. the actual sustained economic growth, not the fake bubble at the very yeah. end of the decade. But the other thing to keep in mind is that there's a lot of politicians that benefit from being able to control the strings, control the money, and make you believe that there's no way you can get yourself out of this or that we can get ourselves out of this as you know millions of individuals working in a free economy. No, no, they need you to believe that you are dependent upon their patronage in order to survive. And it's a lie. And it will not produce the results that they're promising you. It'll only enrich them. Now, they may not understand that, but I don't care at this point because that's what it does. And here's the one thing I'll, we'll end on this. A lot of what we've talked about, again, it seems frustrating because it seems inevitable and what can we really do about it? I want to talk, I want to talk very briefly about what you can do as an individual. Because obviously we want to vote better and we want better representation. And some of these things are out of our, our control, but some of these things are within our control as well. So we don't give legal advice. We don't give financial advice. We don't give an investment advice here, okay? But I will tell you this. As you are looking at what are you going to do in the future, when we know we're going to go into economic hardship and downturns, there are ways that you can effectively prepare for that, whether it's on an investment side, whether it's what you do with your money, how you spend your money, how you invest on your money. Are you investing in hard assets that can actually produce something of value for you? Or are you investing in companies which are highly speculative and fueled by inflationary spending? If you are doing it based off of companies that are fueled by, you are going to be in a lot more pain right now than if you're going to be in places that produce actual things that are of value to people. The other thing to keep in mind too is this. I, I know a lot of people at this point where they're like, forget the stock market, forget retirement accounts. I don't want to deal with food shortages again. Like, I don't want to deal with stuff where, I mean, we're already hearing that there's going to be a butter shortage, you know, ahead of this. I don't want to deal with, like, formula shortages. I don't want to deal with things. Like, people are genuinely concerned about being able to, you know, get enough food or, or, or things like that. We're actually attending a Homestead conference on Friday, which I'm tomorrow. really tomorrow, which I'm really excited about. Um, and, and look, when, when you say this, a lot of people automatically get this image of, oh, you're, you're all a bunch of, like, you know, crazy preppers in your underground bunkers eating your, you know, big can of beets. Like, I want you to think of it in a, in a different way just for a second. We have 10 acres. And, and look, to some people, that's a lot of land. For some people, that's a joke, right? It's definitely not enough to do, like, any sort of major farming or whatnot. But Tina and I like to garden. We like raising animals. We like doing this other stuff. And all of a sudden, we came to the conclusion once that, you know what? We actually have the capacity on our small little piece of land to be able to do something to ensure that not only is our family, you know, have some degree of like food security and things like that, but we have the ability to actually give that to friends of ours that don't have the same amount of property. And, and we're not doing it just because we, we see things happening and it, it's of concern. We're doing it because we genuinely enjoy it and we think it's interesting to learn how to do this. And I'll tell you what, this last year, I made so many mistakes with respect to but I learned so much and I got connected with so many other good people that, Again, they're not trying to force anybody to do anything. They're not trying to say, you got to do this or we're all going to die. They're saying, you know what? This is a way that you can provide value for yourself, value for others. And so one of the things I would encourage people to look at as an individual, 
what are the different skill sets that you can that you can develop? And, and the ability to develop useful skill sets is incredible because of, and I don't mean like going out and getting certifi- certification or degree. What does it mean to like be able to go onto YouTube and learn how to do something? It could be raising livestock. It could be growing food. It could be learning how to weld. It could be learning how to fix a car. It could be learning how to do all these things which have an intrinsic value. Mm-hmm. Yep. This is a great time to start looking at, you know what? I'm going to focus on what are some of these skill sets that the value of having them is timeless. And I guarantee you a couple of things. One, you're actually going to get a sense of accomplishment. Um, You're going to get a sense of accomplishment when you're able to do something and see value from it and see a return on it. And the skill sets that you have like that, they can't be taxed away. They can't be confiscated. Right, You have them. They're yours. They can't be inflated away. They can't be inflated away. You have the ability now to provide something of value for yourself, for your family, for your friends, for your community. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to once again recognize the value of not only of rugged individualism within the United States, but that rugged individualism combined with a sense of community, courage, and competence. So let's develop that in ourselves. Let's develop that in our families. And while we, in, while we want to advocate and fight for the right political actions, we're never going to put ourselves in a position where we're completely dependent on what somebody else does in order to secure, protect, and ensure that our families and communities can thrive. All right. Thank you very much for joining us. This was an exciting episode. Christian, great job. Fantastic. Great job with the making great the job. argument section. I <laughs> love that. So, like, I genuinely think at some point in the future we need to do another episode highlighting and in a larger setting what you just said there because well, we, we've got some people that have that actually was great we've got some people that have actually reached out to us to actually talk about some more of that but anyways yeah. listen if you're you. interested in seeing what we're doing at the home setting conference yeah. tomorrow i will be sure to drop a couple of videos in our volley chat yeah of nick walking around talking to folks oh we got joel salton there daniel salton there yep. justin uh rhodes is going to be there cool. we got uh, john uh, uh john level from yep. warrior, uh, warrior Poet Society. society a ton of other people that are just yeah. really cool people yeah. that have some great capabilities Anyways, thank you very much for joining us. Leave us some comments. Let us know. Give us some feedback on what you thought about this. Join our volley chat so you can have you know, a, a deeper conversation with us. And once again, we'll see you next episode.